Let me start by thanking the organizers for the kind invitation and the con congratulating them for having set up the whole conference in an electronic version in such a short time. Before I start, I would like to make three disclaimers. I started to reflect on this presentation in February when I submitted my abstract. Meanwhile, only three months have passed and it looks like we are living in a completely different world due to the impact of the COVID-19 outbreak. All over a sudden, the aging agenda that was like the elephant in the room has become clearly visible. For how long, I do not know. I dare to hope that we will learn from this crisis and um, start really changing our societies. Hence, I've tried to integrate that element into my presentation. Of course, these are primarily uh, reflection and they will need to be further considered in the future. Secondly, I've focused my presentation on urban planning and therefore excluded rural areas. Um, they are facing different kinds of challenges in relation to aging, still very important ones. Likewise, the continuum between urban and uh, rural areas will not be covered. Third, and lastly, you will understand that I like pictures, and I feel it's a good way to illustrate age narrative. Though I recognize there are limits with pictures, so please do not over-interpret my choices, they are only a sample of all the people's life. Starting with age basics. Well, I'm Julia Wadu and I'm working for Age Platform Europe as policy coordinator um, in charge of health, accessibility and new technologies. I joined the organization um, around 10 years ago. The picture you can see here is, um, has been taken uh, during our General Assembly last June in Brussels. Somehow, I am the voice of all these persons. AGE is a network of 110 organizations of all the persons across the European Union. This organization of the local, regional, national level advocate for the well-being and the rights of people age 50 plus. We do have a secretariat in Brussels and we work with our members to elaborate common position on policy initiatives related to ageing issues. We are also involved in different EU research projects. We are funded by our members and through an operating grant um, of the European Commission. We cover a wide range of issues such as human rights, discrimination, employment, pension, health, social inclusion, long-term care, elder abuse, etc. There are two key parameter, parameters in our work. The first one is a basic. All the people are diverse. They are not an homogeneous group. In our work, we do our best to represent this diversity and to include the diverse perspective. It starts with different age subgroups, since we tend to cover at least two generations, but also taking into account the gender dimension, the geographical perspective, the socioeconomic background, the ethnicity, the socio sexual orientation, the disability, and so forth and so on. Why is it important? Because it mainly means there is no one-size-fits-for-all solution. Here, clearly, the COVID-19 outbreak is showing that not all the all older persons have been eaten in the same way. Their vulnerability is personally not linked to their chronological age, but rather to their specific situation. The second parameter is the human rights perspective. I have illustrated it with the campaign material we used in relation to the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Our aim is to challenge the misconception around ageism and to tackle ageism, um, since ageism and the negative uh, stereotypes have harmful effects on health of older adults. Strangely, and I would say even sadly, the current context of the COVID crisis is putting under the spotlight the issue of human rights and dignity of all the persons. We have recorded an impressive number of strong statements by key persons, like the one delivered on 1st May by Antonio Gutierrez, UN Secretary General, showing how important it is to consider that perspective. So our framework when it comes to health is based very much on this human rights approach. Um, it has been very nicely summarized by Paul McGarry, who is working for the Greater Manchester. It shows how to consider the move from a strictly medical and care approach to a citizens-based approach, and illustrates how this shift is really crucial uh, to have a comprehensive approach of aging. Of course, we need high-quality medical and care services, but we also need to address the issues in the right-hand column. So we might call them the wider determinants of aging. As it is commonly argued in the public health sphere, 
it is important to invest in health promotion and prevention and thus downsize the pressure on healthcare systems. This is very true in the context of the current pandemic, actually, as well as when we look at aging demographics and how to prepare our societies to longer life expectancy. This leads us to um, the age-friendly environments approach that we are promoting. So fostering healthy aging through age-friendly cities and communities. Demographic change and urbanization have created important challenges that need to be addressed to ensure good quality of life for all generations while reducing inequalities and combating social exclusion. As populations age, pressure and challenges on health and well-being both mount and shift, and policymakers are increasingly concerned about the growing burden on the health system in general and long-term care in particular. This diagram from the WHO, the World Health Organization, shows that intrinsic capacity and functional ability are hypothetical lines. The objective is to pump up those lines through what health services can do, what long-term care can do, but also, and very importantly, how environments are designed. The point is to optimize and enhance reserve as early as on possible to have a delay in the decline of people's intrinsic capacity and functional ability, modify the rate of decline and ensure that environments can be supportive. According to the World Health Organization, physical and social environments are the key determinants of whether people can remain healthy, independent and autonomous long into their old age. The WHO Guide of Age-Friendly Cities and Communities has been published in 2008, so quite a long time ago. It's giving concrete illustration about the different domains to be addressed, such as transportation, public spaces, social support, etc. But an additional key element of this guide is important to bear in mind. This is about the involvement and engagement of all the persons themselves all along the process, from the design to the implementation of solutions. Because all the persons are the ultimate experts of their own lives, it's really important to make sure that the their first-hand experience is taking on board and taking into account. This network is existing at the moment. This is the global network of age friendly cities and communities, and it's very much alive, with more than 500 cities across the world that have joined the movement. And thanks to the forthcoming decade of healthy aging, the objective is to continue the effort. This de decade is a proposal from the WHO that could be endorsed by the uh, United Nations as a whole. The objective is to have 10 years of concerted collaboration with all the people at the centre to bring together government, civil society, professional, academia, private sector, media, international agencies with the ultimate goal of improving the life of all the people, their families and their communities. Four areas of action have been defined. The first one is ageism. We are going back to what I explained um, earlier. The second one is age-friendly environments. The third one, integrated care. The fourth one, long-term care. And the launch of the decade is planned for the 1st of October 2020, um, which is um, the um, International Day of uh, Older Persons. So, looking at urban planning aging, there are some key challenges. Obviously, um, time is too short for me to be exhaustive. So, I will highlight the issues that are the most often touched upon by our members, namely social isolation and loneliness, social exclusion, living or aging in place, and finally, accessibility. The four of them are very much interlinked, actually, and they are key in relation to older people's um, well-being and health. Starting with loneliness and social isolation, it is one of the key challenges in relation to aging and clearly not the easiest one to address, but its impact on healthy aging is so important that it is really key to keep it in mind and try to address it. This shows also how much urban planning is not only about technical and infrastructural issues, but also about social ones and how to ensure not to create further isolation having, for instance, spaces where people can meet and eventually, you know, do what they like. COVID-19 outbreak reminded us about this crucial issue. 
Social exclusion. Well, material deprivation is, let's say, decreasing across Europe. There are differences across countries, differences between different groups, but still, what, what is more important, maybe, is that inequalities are raising. So this covers many different in issues, including the impact of gentrification in some urban centers, as well as housing affordability and energy poverty, but also the equal access to basic services, bearing in mind that the digitalization is further increasing the digital gap. So again, important issues that we need to bear in mind when we are doing urban planning. The link here with health inequalities is obvious, keeping in mind that the life course approach and how much experience is accumulated across the lifespan impact on um, people's health while aging. The third um, dimension that I wanted to touch upon and that is also very important uh, to our members is about living or aging in place. As stated in an article published by uh, Tina Buffield, so Sophie Endler and Chris Philipson in 2018, the majority of all the people will continue to prefer to live in communities with a mix of ages. So it does not mean necessarily to stay in the same dwelling, like you can see on the um, left-hand side picture. It can also mean being in the community, but in a kind of different dwelling. So the, the important is rather to develop adequate solutions, enabling all the people to stay included in the community, avoiding targeted approaches, which can become discriminatory with some sort of segregated spaces, which are completely isolated actually from the community. We have to make sure that we not only plan to address the need, but also the preferences of all the people. So bearing in mind how much housing is key to health. So for example, and to link up with the next topic, non-accessible housing increases the risk of falls, injuries, um, restricts social participation simply because you can't go out, negatively affects quality of life if it's poorly insulated, for example, and increases the burden on caregivers and other supporting services if you have to deliver everything at home and you have to support a person um, 24 um, hours a day. Accessibility. Well, accessibility is key to foster autonomy and independent living. It's important to underline that uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities includes provision on accessibility and promotes a universal design approach. Why I am saying so? Well, because this convention, first of all, is also covering older persons. Um, and because it has been ratified by all EU member states and by the European Union. So step by step, it will deliver concrete results and will have to be taken on board, actually, by all policymakers. Accessibility enables people to move around, to do physical activity, to feel safe enough. It has therefore a strong impact uh, on um, their well-being, including their mental health. It covers a wide range of issues like mobility, green space, pavement, built environment, but also access to leisure and cultural activities, to information and key services, including those who are digitalized. It can also help to tackle air pollution within cities by encouraging everyone to use public transport, to walk, to bike, because accessibility is crucial for persons with reduced mobility like older persons, but like a number of older persons, not all of them. It is uh, also improving the quality of life of everyone. The COVID-19 uh, outbreak is uh, giving actually new challenges to organize the public space. Street space, real, uh, street space reallocation is ongoing with car-free zones, bike networks, speed limits, making sure that we can keep physical um, distancing as well and respecting all these rules, but also because we need to um, ensure that further digitalization will not end up into a wider digital gap, notably due to inaccessibility. And we see that how much we rely on uh, digital uh, services at the moment. So to conclude, urban planning can be a strong tool to enhance healthy aging and enable all the people to be and to do what they value most. Um, so it requires to create a positive view on aging so that we can all look forward to a positive future in later life and move from the emotional alarming calls that a silver tsunami is coming to an empathetic human rights movement of a society for all ages. Enable engagement of citizens, including all the persons, in the development and implementation of policies and activities in order to respect lifestyle, choices, needs and preferences. 
organize and plan cities for persons of all ages, fostering solidarity between generations as a key element for a sustainable future. And last but not least, mitigate siloed approach, breaking the silos, for example, between different municipalities, departments and mainstreaming aging issues. Thank you very much.